Okay, so um, the first set of uh, body of, of uh, discussion I wanted to, to offer today relates to the topic that we've been exploring most recently, but it also links back to an earlier one. Specifically, during our last lecture, we took a look at particle MCMC. Uh, particle MCMC uh, comes here towards the end of the class, partly as a culmination of, uh, of several lines of exploration we've been we've been um, uh, examining in the uh, in recent months. Uh, we went on a tour through methods for parameter inference uh, at its most basic level calibration turning evidence of behavior over, over time often uh, in the world um, to be compared with emergent model behavior, endogenous model behavior, and used to, uh, to estimate a single best value of a parameter or a vector of parameters most commonly. The vector parameters by which the, the model's behavior best matches uh, the observed data. And that can be performed for both deterministic and stochastic systems with the proviso that if it's a stochastic system, we need to typically run an ensemble of realizations of the model. For a given parameter vector, we may see from one realization to another to another different fidelities of match of model output with, with the observed data because the model output is variable for a given set of parameters. And calibration, uh, the calibration process needs to, therefore, for a given parameter vector, run the model again and again. Um, and then often it will take the mean discrepancy of model results against the observed data or the median discrepancy against the observed data. Um, we then went on to approximate Bayesian computation which is a more uh, general um, and uh, more powerful method, uh, rather than requiring us to put all our eggs in one basket and commit to a certain best parameter value. It lets us sample from different parameter values. As long as the model matches, model output matches the observed data to a certain point, as measured by a discrepancy metric, say lying below a certain specified value, we'll accept that as a valid parameter. Otherwise, we won't. Can we sample those parameters from a prior distribution, hence approximate Bayesian computation? But there's no likelihoods involved, hence approximate Bayesian computation. And we graduated from that to MCMC, where we have honest to goodness Bayesian sampling. We have a prior distribution, but we also have a likelihood functions that together we can multiply to get something proportional by Bayes rule to the posterior distribution. And that allows us to sample possible values of parameters again and again and again, sampling them uh, in a way where we, we assess, uh, we're assessing the, the fidelity of the model results to the, uh, to the observed data and figuring out whether to accept or reject the given sample. Those samples that have really high, where those samples of parameters where the model exhibits really high fidelity to the observed data, um, where the likelihood function is high, it's a really good match. The model with those parameters is really likely to, to yield the observed data. Those will tend to be sampled more. Those will tend to show up in our samples more frequently, those vectors. Those will be more plausible values. The posterior distribution will tend to have a peak um, uh, around there, tend to have high values around there, I should say. 
Uh, but those, when there's a poor fidelity match, um, will tend maybe considered, but they'll be considered a lot less likely. So PMCM, or excuse me, MCMC allows us to explore that um, with some richness. Uh, but that's for deterministic systems. And I left it as kind of a, a vague matter of, well, what if, what if it's not deterministic? What then? If we want, want to get something like MCMC for stochastic systems, well, we're coming to it. And we came to it last time. We then switched over to latent state inferencing. Here, our focus shifted. It was no longer in finding the parameter values, inferring parameter values that best explain the data. Rather, it was given we have a stochastic system and a fixed set of static parameters, maybe we have some evolving parameters. Contact rate evolves over time, maybe, or the, the fraction of people who are infected who end up or and develop symptoms who end up needing hospitalization. Maybe that shifts because of demographic, you know, shifts in where the infection is occurring and in, in, in demographics and whether it's in older age groups or lower. Um, maybe those evolve, but but the static parameter values are fixed. So we're not trying to infer those. Instead, we're trying to infer what's the state of the system, I mean, it involves stochastically. Things happen, outbreaks unexpectedly happen. Professors are exposed to infected students in the last hour of their teaching for the entire year um, in the first close contact. Um, and, you know, unexpected events happen. Um, and when you have a stochastic system, even, even if we have parameter values that are fixed, that won't tell us the, the outcome for the system. It will give us a, a, a range of possibilities because it's stochastic. And what latent state inference or so-called filtering aims to do is to estimate that state of a stochastic system, recognizing that it's not a fixed thing given parameters. We want to infer what's the actual situation here? How many undiagnosed infectives are there? How many early stage infectives? Uh, or, or how about folks who are exposed? How many people, after all, are really recovered? Um, if we're interested in seroprevalence, how many are susceptible? These are things where there's different possibilities given the data. And we want to know, given the data we see and given system structure, and it's vagaries of stochastics. What's the real situation? And we explored basically two ways of doing that on its own, Kalman filtering, a classic way dating back to the beginning of the 1960s and available all around us for, for avionics, probably these days for automotive control, for our, our GPS applications, et cetera but really useful for second to second updating, like you might expect to see in a, in a rocket or in a plane. Um, but we also explored particle filtering and particle filtering involved a, a, a much more general uh, and much more powerful approach than Kalman filtering. Uh, Kalman filtering adjusted our state estimate to best match the data in a, in a rather direct way. We had a single best state estimate, X hat, and that changed when we knew, saw new data. And it changed in a way that balanced our confidence in the data with our confidence in the model. The longer the model was going on without data, the less and less confident we were about where we were, the more uncertainty grows about where we really are. Um, and, uh, and common filtering balances to give us a, an estimate of our maximum likelihood estimate, our X hat, and adjusted our estimate of X hat. Particle filtering, by contrast, took a very different approach. Rather than putting our eggs into one basket of that, 
of that single best estimate and having a covariance around it, like in Coleman filtering. With particle filtering, we had all distribution. It was an important sample distribution. We had these samples we call particles, each associated with a weight representing its degree of consistency with the data or its credibility as it were. But, but, but something more concrete than that, a weight, if one particle had a weight twice of another one, particle A has a weight twice as particle B, it means you, you'd encounter the state of particle A twice as frequently as a plausible state of the, link, the state of the system as, as particle B. Both are samples from a distribution, but the samples you get from particle A occur twice as frequently because it has a weight of twice that of, of particle B. Um, so this weight reflected the degree of, of uh, representation of that particle in the distribution. That's what the importance weight does. And we always sampled from the particles by their weight with the probability of getting each according to their weight. Mm. Now, particle filtering um, uh, dispensed with the really tight distributional assumptions of Kalman filtering. It also didn't require us to linearize a model, so we could use it for a broader set of models. We didn't have to compute the Jacobian. And uh, in general, it allows us to, to sample values which might not have a nice unimodal shape. They might not be like a normally distributed uh, shape in terms of our, our state. There are a lot of normal distributions that went into the formulation of the Kalman filter, which were freed with particle filtering. And in general, we might have a distribution that has multiple peaks. One peak that, oh, there's very, very few cases here and another one, uh, it, one, one peak where there's, we think there's few infections out there, just really good reporting. And another one where there's lots of infections and poor reporting or something like that. Um, so particle filtering allowed us this opportunity to explore systems where we had, where we had non-unimodal distributions. Maybe we haven't seen infections reported in a while in a small town. And one of our hypotheses are it's all gone. It's cleared out. And the other one is uh, it's still there, or just none have been reported recently. And it's going to pop out any minute. And some particles believe one and some believe the other. And it's, it's kind of a, a multimodal distribution for what's believed. Um, uh, either there's more and more infection building up, we're just not seeing it, and we're going to get it soon, or, or there's none. But then last time we went into particle MCMC, which combined these two. It combined latent state inference with parameter inference. Um, now, we're going to actually talk about some things which are going to be helpful in practice for MCMC as well as PMCMC today. And to do that, um, I'm going to go uh, to some areas of these slides, which I've, which I've added, but which are, are, are going to be valuable for, for talking about both PMCMC and MCMC. I'm going to be talking here about key practical challenges when we perform MCMC and PMCMC. Um, many of these are inherited from MCMC, but PMCMC offers some additional twists. So the first thing I want to talk about is discrepancy. And, um, and, and here, we're, we're trying to get a model that matches really well the observed data. Um, you'll recall that with MCMC, we're trying to estimate parameter values given the data and given the model. With PMCMC, we're trying to estimate those parameters, but also the latent state given the data, given the model. Um, now, uh, when we're trying to estimate that, in both cases, we have likelihood functions. That's what distinguishes these methods from say approximate Bayesian computation. Approximate Bayesian computation, we dispensed with likelihood functions. But here with PMCM and MCMC, we have honest to goodness Bayesian computation and we have honest to goodness 
likely it functions. What does that likely function do? Well, it says, what's the likelihood of observing this data in light of these parameters? Or for PMCMC, what's the likelihood of observing this data in light of these parameters, but also the latent state of the system? So we had we had likelihood functions. Um, and those likelihoods, almost inevitably, not in every single case, but I'd say the large majority of times, they compare model output with empirical data. Now, just reflect on that. I mean, if, if we're trying to estimate the likelihood of observing data given, that's not what's shown here, but if, if we want to um, estimate the likelihood of observing data given a set of parameters for a given model, um, Generally, that's hard to do without running the model on the parameters. After all, I mean, if we had a set of parameters, you know, contact rate X, you know, contact rate, you know, uh, on average uh, nine people per day and, and recovery rate um, of, you know, 0.1, if, if those were our, our, our vector of parameters, Theta. Going from that to say how well, how how plausible is it that we have those parameters in light of the data? How plausible is it that those parameters would result in the data? To put it more correctly, um, it's really hard because we have to turn those parameters into into something that can be compared with the data, like cases that would be expected. In order to do that, we use the model. So the model is involved is kind of turning parameter values into, into observations that could be compared with the empirical data. Um, so we plug in this parameter value vector into the model and out pops cases from the model. And then we can have a likelihood function that compares those cases to the observed data. And the net upshot is a likelihood function that can say for these parameters, what's our likelihood of observing the data? The model is just used as a key part of that process. Um, and although it's more sophisticated, um, you can do a similar thing with particle MCMC. So the, the upshot of it is that um, for, for MCMC and for PMCMC, uh, we, we're going to be having data from the model for a given parameter or for a given parameter latent state that's compared with the observed data uh, for, for particle MCMC that's done by a particle, which has this latent state and it has, and it's being run for, for a certain set of parameters. And, and we're asking what's the likelihood of observing the data. Okay. so there's a model output for these. For MCMC, it's for this data. For PMCMC, it's for these two things. There's model output. It looks kind of like this. Um, just This is actually for particle filtering, but this could be for a single theta with, uh, with PMCMC. It would, it would look something like this. This is what we call the posterior predictive distribution of the model. It's the model predicting what, what is in a quantity that can be compared with the empirical data. So here we're sampling from the model's output and comparing it with empirical data. That's after all what we compare in the likelihood functions. The likelihood functions are comparing what the model produces with observed data. And this shows what it looks like over time from the posterior. Again, this happens to be from particle filter, but, but the same thing is true for particle MCMC and a, and a variant is true for MCMC. There's model output over time resulting from these here parameters or from MPMCMC just as much as there is in particle filtering. So we can compare model output over time with observed data. 
right? I mean, that's, that's why we're estimating these thetas because they give rise to behavior over time. That's why we're estimating this, these, the theta and the latent state because it gives rise to behavior over time that we can compare with empirical data. And we want to find good ones of these and good ones of these, the best that will give us the, the or, or plausible ones that um, in light of the data and in light of the observed data, the empirical data. So this is like model output compared with empirical data. And, you know, there are times where it matches really well. And there's times where it, it doesn't match great. Like right here is a case where we had some historic data and the model just couldn't reproduce. Given, given what it understood the situation and the dynamics, something else was going on here. The model posterior distribution up here just couldn't produce something to match this empirical data. Um, you can see here it didn't quite match, but it quickly followed upwards and, and did okay. But there's a few other cases where it didn't match. What I'm comparing here is what the model thinks the data should have been, the posterior predictive distribution with, that's, that's what I'm calling here, uh, posterior predictive distribution with what the data actually was. And so we can compare the two. And, and generally to, to assess this discrepancy, we'll use one of, two, one of two methods. We'll, we'll ask what fraction of the time, if we sample from this posterior predictive distribution, does the actual data fall within those, those samples. In other words, is it in the high posterior density region? These data points are in the high posterior density region. That it's, it's peaked. If we, if we were to kind of do a cross section here and look at it from the side, we'd see a peak here. And these things are, are right squarely in the peak. Um, they're, they're pretty squarely in the peak here. Uh, pretty well here, uh, but then there's going to be some places where it flubs and and it's not. And so we'll we'll assess what fraction of the time does it fall uh, does it fall within the you know the uh, a certain bands around the median, the 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 ninety ninety percent credibility interval around the median. Uh, that within which 90% of the samples fall, to what degree is, is, uh, is the empirical data in that? And we'll ask how, how uh, what fraction of the time does the, the, the empirical data fall within the, the observed uh, data from the model? Um, but a common thing that we typically make use of, and it's a very simple thing to do is we, we calculate a scalar discrepancy. And it's a very simple thing. We calculate the norm, the sum square difference, um, and the square root of that. Uh, so the L2 norm, um, square root of the sum of squares difference of sampled particles from the observed data. So we, we sample from these particles again and, and, and again and again. And we're, we're, we're asking, you know, uh, when we sample from the particles, each particle we sample has a certain has a certain prediction for what's going on there in terms of each of the observables, and we take the difference between what it predicts and what's actually observed, and we 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 take those differences and we square them up and 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 uh, and we add them together and we we observe a, a total from that. And you want to be careful if there are different types um, so that the really big ones don't overwhelm the small ones. You can normalize. But the basic gist is we, we take a sum squared difference. Um, and if you look at one of the papers I posted um, to the course site, you can see how we do that. Or in Cheyenne's thesis also posted to the course site. And so we, we compute a what's called the discrepancy, which basically says, how far off is this set of samples, this distribution of samples um, from the observed data? Um, 
and we can judge kind of the, the fidelity or the pedigree of different, um, how well we're doing with our, our fitting, with our estimates using this discrepancy. Um, we can say, you know, is one output better than another? Does one model give a, one particle filter model uh, give a better results than another? And in Cha Yan's thesis, she compares, for example, two models of child and adults, one where the, the kind of line is drawn at um, zero to five-year-olds on the one, or zero to four-year-olds on the one hand, and five plus year olds on the other, those are considered the, the two age categories and in other words, divided at 15. And she compares what the discrepancy is and one of them gives better results than another. So generally we, we in terms of discrepancy, we wanna, when we're performing MCMC and PMCMC, we care that the results kind of match the empirical data well. We don't want results that are systematically off in some way. We want results that are close to the empirical data. And so this will be one of the criteria we're often using to judge, you know, how well is the model doing? Um, how well is our fitting doing with PMCMC and MCMC? Same thing with particle filtering. So that's one of the challenges here. And it's not all that different from what we do in approximate patient computation, where we, again, we have a discrepancy function or calibration, where we have a discrepancy function that we're trying to minimize. In, in approximate patient computation, we have a discrepancy function where we only accept things if, it, if, if, if the discrepancy is below a certain threshold, epsilon. Um, very, very much in that flavor. Here too, we could calculate a discrepancy. We just do it with sampled particles and the details are in that thesis. Um, okay, so, so that's one of the challenges and it's, it's a familiar one. Um, uh, it should be you know, familiar from thinking about uh, calibration or thinking about approximate Bayesian computation. But there's two challenges that are quite distinct for these. Um, and I really need to introduce you to them because when I do MCMC, or when I do PMCMC, these things occupy a very large fraction of my worries. Discrepancy is often not the really big worry. It's not the thing which takes a lot of my time to, to try to address. I'm, I'm focused on these things, the acceptance rate and the convergence. And those things, will be less familiar. So I want to talk about this. Um, the idea here is, is a, um, it's a simple one. And if, if I had my, if I had my um, uh, forethought, uh, you know, if I had presence of forethought, I would have pulled up the algorithm here. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll just uh, copy it here and we'll, we'll, um, go and, and, and have it nearby uh, because I'll probably flip back to it here. So apologies, um, I'll, I'll just stick it here. So here's, remember the algorithm, the, the, uh, uh, the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. Um, this Metropolis Hastings algorithm is what we used for MCMC and a variant of it was used for PMCMC. Um, uh, the, the difference was when we were calculating this, we needed to perform a particle filtering. But the basic idea is that we, we get a candidate value and we accept or reject it. And I had a nice little picture of it with this, right? We had a, maybe it wasn't so nice to you, but we had a current point and we picked a candidate and we either accepted or rejected it based on the shows the posterior and based on the on the ratio of these posterior values of the posterior of the candidate, given the data, to, to the current point, we either accepted or rejected. If this thing was equal or bigger than that, we always went there. If this thing was less than that, we went there with a certain probability. You should remember that. Um, so this gets us to sample more 
from these high regions, right? Or we're, we're sampling more from ones that are really good because we're more likely to go there and we're less likely to leave there. Um, whereas if we're dealing with something like this, this little bottom land here, um, uh, lots of the places around it will be better than it and it will tend to gravitate away. So it won't sample as frequently here. And it can be proven that this yields a sampling proportional to the value of this P. You'll get lots of samples from these regions, fewer, but some from these um, with the number of samples uh, of proportional to the density of those regions. Um, okay, so, so um, the acceptance rate here concerned um, that algorithm. It, it, what fraction of the time do we accept or reject? And I, you could be excused for thinking like, well, yeah, okay. So I guess we could keep track of acceptance, but why is that of interest? I mean, yeah, it seems like an arbitrary metric. So sure, maybe my acceptance is high, maybe it's low, who cares? Well, it, we care because if acceptance is really low, if it's super low, if we only accept one out of every thousand, we'll move across the space really slowly, right? Well, only one out of every thousand times will we move. And otherwise we'll just dwell where we are and we will, we will keep on repeating, um, emitting the current point again and again and again and again, potentially in a stentorian voice. Um, you know, just repeating it again and again, the same sample, the same theta, the same set of parameter values, or for PMCMC theta and the same sample, uh, latent state estimate, we'll just repeat, repeat, repeat a thousand times over. And it, you know, it won't get us very far. It, it won't, it won't, it'll be really slow to explore the space. We want to explore it. We want to traverse it and, you know, spend lots of time in its nooks and crannies and, and, and sample it well, because we want a representative set of samples. And instead we'll be just sitting, you know, sort of spinning our wheels in certain regions of it, not going very far. And so if we want to sample it well, we're going to have to run a zillion of these iterations. We're going to have to run again, 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 you know, thousands, thousands, thousands of times to allow us to explore it because we're not really accepting many. We're just dwell, sitting there, dwelling in one place in, in, a, in a place that, um, uh, that is not particularly privileged and then we're, we're, we're not moving. So we wanna move quite a bit. We wanna, we wanna be able to move enough that we, we thoroughly sample the space. Um, and acceptance rates, uh, the, the guidance on acceptance rates from the folks um, uh, who, who uh, specialize in this differ. Um, I, I should have my, uh, my uh, Bayesian textbook by uh, yeah, Bayesian data analysis by Galman and others. Um, this particular textbook, I think, recommends uh, an acceptance rate. This uh, Bayesian data analysis by Galman, uh, Carlin, Stern, and Rubin. Great, great, great book talks about uh, MCMC amongst other methods. Um, they recommend something like 29% or, or upper 20s um, uh, acceptance rate. So, so you have it somewhere below a third of the time. By contrast, there's some other practitioners who say, no, come on, you, you should have like 80% acceptance rate. The point is you don't want like one out of a thousand times. You, you want a very, decent acceptance as in like a good fraction of the time, like a third of the time or, you know, 75% of the time. Those are respectable uh, acceptance rates. You know, 1% of the time is, and that's kind of for the birds. Uh, you're you're going to be going really slowly. You're going to need a lot of iterations to explore it. And you're going to be paying computationally for that. You're going to have to run this chain for a very long period of time. So, so acceptance rate matters. Um, uh, it it's important. So um, uh, it turns out um, 
that uh, that when we have uh, when we care about acceptance rates, there's certain things that that matter. And for some reason, my my slides here are are a little bit out of uh, out of order. Um, for MCMC, uh, there's a couple of things that that are really are notable impacts on acceptance rate. Um, so the first is this, is the features of the likelihood function and, and particularly how dispersed it is, how tight it is or how dispersed, how, how picky it is. So if your likelihood function here, this is your likelihood, right? It says how likely is it that I observe this data given these parameters? If that's really narrow, if it says, eh, you're you're unlikely to observe this, unlikely to observe that, if it's if it if it's uh, if it's saying, you know, you're very unlikely to observe anything but a very small number of Ys, you know, possibility of Ys, it's gonna be rejecting just a lot of possibilities. It's gonna be, it's gonna be treating a lot of um of these thetas is implausible because they don't square up with the data according to its very picky criteria, picky yoon criteria, um, uh, overly picky. And so that's gonna lead it to reject a lot of the time um, because it's going to, uh, to be unhappy with the posterior value at a lot of, a lot of other places. It will just have some tight peaks in theta. And beyond that, it'll say, this is no good. That's no good. That's no good. And it will, it, it will reject a lot of these things. So it'll be like, you've got this very peak thing here, and then it, it rejects things around it. And it'll just tend it to kind of dwell on this peak um, in, a, in an unpleasant way. Um, so if you have a likelihood function that's um, that's overly narrow, it'll tend to be picky. If this is very broad, if it allows, you know, that 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 theta is possible. Oh gosh, that one too. Oh yeah, that one. Well, okay, we'll let well, that one get by. Oh man, this yeah, this isn't great, but we'll let it slip on. Um, if it's very generous or very charitable in its uh, interpretation, then you'll you'll actually uh, start to have a less peaked um, uh, lo lo less peaked uh, posterior distribution. It'll be able to explore it quite quite well. and it it'll, it'll accept a lot of the time. But you may impair your discrepancy. Um, you know, you might start to, get it allowing in um, some values for theta that really just don't match the data. So, so if we broaden the likelihood function too much, we water down our quality, we'll get a mismatch on the discrepancy side. Our discrepancy will suffer, but we'll get more acceptance rate. And, and this is part of the trade-off of, of, of MCMC. We're, trading off hard things. Um, we're, we're trading off um, acceptance rate with, with discrepancy. Um, so one way to do is with the likelihood function. You tune the, the, the dispersion parameter in a likelihood or otherwise uh, adjust it. You may remember from one of my presentations, I showed different dispersion parameters, wider likelihood, thinner likelihood, and this this is one of the reasons you choose a, a broad or likely to have good acceptance rate for MCMC or by extension PMCMC. Another thing is it relates to to this algorithm is this um, picking a random value for perturbation. If your perturbations are very small, if you're only picking small steps in theta. You're only picking small differences for our candidate. It's kind of like you'll, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're here and you pick a perturbation from it, a, a changed value of, of theta, a candidate value. And it's always gonna be very close by, very small step size. 
Well, you know, chances are the posterior distributions will have very similar values there if the likelihood isn't too narrow. And so you're likely to accept it frequently. By contrast, if you have a big step size and you could, you know, zip over from here to here or here to here or, you know, here to, to down here or to down here or down here, chances are you could end up in a bad way. You could end up in a, you know, in a place that's really hurting posterior wise and it's unlikely to accept it. So you're, you'll have a, a low acceptance rate. So step size um, uh, is something which also impacts acceptance rate. Too small a transition step leads to slow exploration. Too, uh, oh, sorry, too, too large a, uh, a step size will lead to low acceptance rate. It will lead to all these implausible things and you'll reject and reject and reject. Um, but if you make too small a one, you'll, you'll, you'll accept a lot, but it will lead to slow exploration. So yeah, you'll accept it a lot, but it'll kind of crawl along. It'll crawl along there. So it's, it's going to be accepting it again and again and again, but you got to do a lot of acceptances in order to move any distance here. So, so, so that too is, is one of these uh, trade-offs. Um, from um, from associated with uh, MCMC. Um, now the uh, the final um, thing is that if you're th that can impact it is choice of likelihood function. Um, if you if you're not careful picking a, a likelihood function, um, uh, or if you're if if you end up picking one that maybe um, uh, doesn't, um, it, it, if, if you, yeah, if you, you can end up picking one that's disadvantaged compared to another. And um, for example, we've, we've tried using a beta distribution uh, versus uh, a gamma distribution at times or um, a binomial versus a negative binomial. And, it turns out these these things matter. Um, uh, you can often tune a little bit the functional form of your likelihood to get some better results, acceptance rate. Um, that isn't to be dismissed. Um, so, so these things for MCMC are things you you play with, and and very commonly you you play with the transition step size. Um, and you play with the dispersion parameter. Um, and you try to boost your acceptance rate to something respectable. Um, now, something I'm not gonna have time to talk about, but which is important, has to do with um, the, um, uh, the issue of uh, covariance uh, between uh, parameters. And the idea here is, hey, if you're, parameters have high covariance. If, if they're really coupled in some way, like maybe you have contact rate and probability of transmission per contact. Um, if you assume a really high contact rate, it, given the same data, suggests a lower probability of transmission per contact. Um, but if you posit a really low contact rate, you're gonna need to assume a high transmission rate per contact to explain the data. So they tend to co-vary and sampling in that case can be a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit tricky because you're, you're not sampling from each independently. It's like you're, you're, you're sampling from a thin set of possibilities of essentially their product or something. And um, that, can, that can zap your acceptance rate. Um, my colleague Jushin Liu in math and stats is an expert in that. And you can do some things there. There's some tricks that you can do and we have done in some of our work, uh, like transforming them or reducing them to a single parameter, like taking the multiplication of them. Um, uh, and um, you can also, uh, you can uh, explore, explore them 
it's related to the transformation. You can explore them in some fashion that better um, accommodates um, uh, their, their potential interaction. But I won't, I won't go into that. I want to talk about PMCMC. So with PMCMC, we have all of these things that we just had, but we have one other thing as well. So by sort of the same token, I should, I should uh, copy this one into, into here. Um, so with PMCMC, uh, beyond the dispersion and the step size and the quality of likelihood function and covariance, there's actually two other things we found quite, um, quite important. And the first is the particle count. You may say, what? Like, why does particle count matter? Well, it does. And the reason it does seems to be because the number of particles impacts the quality of the posterior estimate. To explain this, I'm going to need to, to go back earlier in the, in the presentation. So apologies. Uh, why is that? Well, um, uh, it, it has to do with um, how, how uh, part of, particle MCMC um, works. This is specific to PMCMC here, this slide. Um, and specifically, we're, we're exploring here, we've got to take the ratio of these posteriors, right? Um, and, uh, and, and that involves uh, uh, taking, taking this ratio. Now, um, it turns out in order to take this ratio, um, this ratio is, it's realized, we can compute it um, by the result of particle filtering. In order to compute this, we need to do a particle filtering. So, so there's a particle filtering performed here for this and for this. Um, um, there was earlier, uh, this is the current point. This is the sample point. And um, in order to compute that, that's computed as part of PMCMC. So we're, we're doing PMCMC for two reasons. Oh, sorry, we're doing particle filtering for two reasons. We're sampling this, um, this latent state, that's the trajectory, but we're also computing this value, which is used in this posterior. And it turns out that if we have fewer particles, the estimate of this will be worse. Why? Well, it turns out that it, it, it's based on, I showed you this last time, going through every single particle and computing an average of their weights, um, et cetera. And um, if we only have 10 particles, we're going to get a lousy estimate out for this. Uh, if we have hundreds of particles, we'll start getting more reasonable. If we have thousands of particles, we'll get more reasonable yet. Um, and so when it comes time to, uh, to performing um, this, uh, to, 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 to dealing with the acceptance rate during the PMCMC algorithm, where we're accepting or rejecting based on the posterior value, we um, we're going to do a lot, have a lot more reliable judgment of that if we are performing it, if we're performing our particle filters with lots of particles. So particle count of particles matters for a large model, a large dynamic model. It matter it, we have to have lots of particles because we need to. We need to kind of sample the state space, reasonably high density, um, and the set of possible states uh, that that can be realistically exercised in in a in the model evolution. Um, if we have a smaller model, a smaller number of particles may do. Um, we've had really small models, SEIR model, where uh, you know thousands of particles, ten thousand particles, good to go. Great, great stuff. 
Um, I think Shayan's thesis used, you know, 10,000 particles or something like that um, for pertussis and for measles. For our COVID-19 model, which is much bigger, we need hundreds of thousands of particles. Um, and uh, so when it comes to acceptance rate, particle count really matters. I'll, I'll show you a picture of this. So uh, this is from some of our PMCMC work uh, with COVID-19 model and wastewater data and, and, and uh, data from, um, from the health system. But as you increase the number of particles, this is like 300,000 particles, 200,000 particles, 100,000. Um, uh, the acceptance rate notably rises. We haven't done anything. No other parameters are changed. It's just the quality of the posteriors we're getting out is, is improved. We're sampling it more efficiently. We're getting better estimates of the latent state out because we have more possibilities to choose from. And you can see it goes from, in this case, uh, something like 0.27 to you know, 0.48 or something. Well, a quite large increase in acceptance rate. Um, same thing here. Um, and in general, you see this, this rising. Um, acceptance rate rises with particle count, with PMCMC. Particle counts matter for PMCMC. More particles, higher quality, and, and you'll get better acceptance rate. Now, more particles means more work to simulate the particles. But then you'll get higher acceptance rate and you can explore faster in the distribution. So you may have to run it for less time. So there's a, there's a, a balance there. Um, uh, and uh, you don't wanna have so many particles. You never, you know, it takes forever to compute a single iteration. And you, maybe in theory, you have a great acceptance rate, but you're, so infrequently moving. Um, so it takes so long to compute each iteration that it doesn't really help you a lot, but you don't want so few particles, your acceptance rate um, is really poor and you end up not, not, um, not moving. Um, uh, okay, so um, the other thing I, I will say, and, and this is a puzzling thing, is the number of data points. We, we actually found that if we have too many historic data points, like many, many hundreds, um, it, it seems that the likelihood uh, or the, the posterior values get very, very small and the ratios of them may get uh, impaired by round off error. So um, that's more work to be done there. Um, okay. so. MCMC, PMCMC, acceptance rates are key. Um, uh, you want to, you got to sample a large enough set of parameter values that you set of well-mixed samples and you need to have good acceptance rate to have it, to be well-mixed as we'll see for the convergence issue. Um, uh, and as I said, with PMCMC, you can get better acceptance with higher particle count, but it slows down the sampling. Um, and you know, you you often have to trade off this desire for a higher acceptance rate with the speed with which the algorithm is going. And and I I like to speak about the sampling rate. How many samples I get out per day? That's what I often try to optimize. Um, that, that's raised by acceptance rate being raised, but it's also raised by doing less work per, per iteration, which means somewhat lower particle count. And you gotta trade those off. So acceptance rate is important. And one of the reasons it's important is for convergence. I wanna, I wanna come back to this diagram. Um, we have a posterior, we wanna explore it. We wanna, we want to sample more frequently in high density regions and less frequently in low density regions. Mm. Um, and when you sample this, remember we're sampling here from values of, of theta. These are uh, values of parameters 
for PMCMC, we're also sampling from, from the latent state. Well, what you want is a set of samples that are that have this um, nice exploration of the space. They collectively, they've just been all over the space, going back and forth, zipping back and forth here, sampling, 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 not spending you know, all their time in this region, not just being in this region and occasionally going down to here and coming back. No, 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 you want something that, that samples many different values. In order to assess this, we use what's called a trace plot. And a trace plot is not a plot over time. A trace plot is the x-axis will be iterations and the y-axis will be the value sampled. So this to our right is a trace plot. Here we have iterations on the, on the x-axis and we have values of the parameter on the y-axis. Don't worry about this, what this parameter is. I'm, I'm just gonna show you a bunch of these. Um, show you ones of higher quality and ones of lower quality, ones where you should be alarmed to increase the acceptance rate, others where you could say that is good sampling. So this is quite good sampling. What we see is kind of, it's zipping around to different possible values of this parameter, um, kind of exploring them really well. Um, and you don't see it just spending forever in certain areas of it or, or slowly wandering it, it seems to explore it quite well. Um, so it's zipping around back and forth here. Remember, this is the value of the parameter shown along the axis in this diagram. So it's kind of going back and forth with different values of the parameter. That's the y axis here. It's going up and down, and up and down, and up and down. That's kind of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it's spending more time in this region. That's probably the high posterior density region or a high posterior density region, but um, it's doing a pretty good job. And this is a histogram of this. So if you kind of look at this from the side and were to kind of shine a light this way, you know, you'd see darker regions in the center where there's lots of samples and lighter regions out here. So you'd get something like this, you know, its peak is somewhere just short of 3.5, I guess. Um, uh, and uh, and then it um, it sort of you know peters out by 4.5. It's very unlikely. Very few samples are 4.5. Very few are at 2.5 down here. Um, so this is a trace plot. And when we look at that, we we are lent comfort and and hope. This is a this is a quite nicely sampling trace plot. It's, this is a sign of good sampling. Here's another one. It's a sign of, of good sampling. This, this warms my heart. When I see this, my, my, uh, my heart leaps uh, with, with happiness. Um, and uh, this is a, a very nicely sampled, even better than this one. This one is getting a little bit sparse, but this one is honest to goodness, greatness. It's, it's just great, right? And, and again, the peak is somewhere in here between 0 0.60 and 0 0.65, um, but it, some go down as far as here. So, so get used to reading these trace plots. They're, they're useful. Um, now I'm gonna show you progressively more less desirable ones. Till the end, ladies and gentlemen, I show you ones that are downright pathological. Um, I hope I don't lose too many people uh, in disgust. Um, okay, so so here's here's another trace plot. This one doesn't make my heart sing. Um, it uh, it you know it's it it's got something there, um, but it, it it's it's starting to dwell. Like like take a look at this. It's it's really dwelling for quite some time there. And you just don't see it really highly densely sampling this. Yeah, it's, it's going back and forth. It's, you know, zipping back and forth. 
but it's not really ripping back and forth. It's kind of slowly going back and forth and yeah, okay. Um, but you, you want a lot more samples for this. I would run it 10 times as long um, to get it to, 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 to be something like this, where it's really explored it. This, this is, it's not great. Uh, if I saw this, I'd say, oh, you're, you're almost there. You got to run it. You either got to increase the acceptance rate more. You got to run it, you know, five to 10 times, 10 times more samples. But um, uh, it's not quite there yet. Um, not quite. This is, uh, uh, this, gosh, this is going to make me feel rather uncomfortable. Um, um, so, so, so this isn't great either. I mean, um, you get these hiatuses where it kind of goes high for a while and kind of sticks there, but there's only like three of them here and, and they're kind of underrepresented. And there's a couple of ones down here. Uh, you got some work to do here. This one is, is um, it's just not a really high density sampling. It's kind of like for this, that it, you know, it, it kind of went and it, spent a lot of time, maybe, maybe this peak is this one over here. It went here once and spent a bunch of time and then it kind of came back and, and then eventually got over here again, spent some time here and came back. And, and um, it's really not zipping back and forth like this one is, uh, you know, up and down, up and down. It's, it's ooh, um, it's, it's not great. Um, this also, uh, uh, yeah, we, we need a, a lot more. We need to, we need to increase the, um, the acceptance rate. It's only kind of episodically and in a kind of dilettante way, exploring this high value, this higher values of this parameter where it goes up here. It's only, um, it's only exploring them kind of in an anecdotal way. And we need to, to have it do better. Oh boy, oh, this is horrible. Um, yeah, you could see, so this is where it's dwelling, right? It's, it, the acceptance rate is, is lagging here. So it, it's, it's got, it, it doesn't accept anything it looks like between here and here. It's going like, I don't know, 500 samples or something um, without accepting a new value. It's just sitting there dwelling it's like it's sitting on this peak, sitting pretty, and it's just sitting there and not accepting anything. Um, we got some work to do here. We uh, maybe we need to reduce the step size. So because maybe it's sitting in this thing and it's considering something way out here, rejecting it, way out here, rejecting it, way down here, rejecting it, and it's not seriously exploring. This is also a long dwell, a long dwell. Um, this kind of blockiness. That's a sign that uh, you've got some work to do seriously with your acceptance rate. If it's kind of going and just staying the same value of this parameter for iteration after iteration after iteration after iteration, yeah, there's the acceptance rate needs to be to be upped. Um, there, there's something going on. Oh man, don't show me that. Yeah, this is this is like more pathological yet. Um, really unpleasant. Oh boy. Um, Oh gosh, um, yeah, this is this is not good. Like this, th this is not nearly as much um, as it needs to. This is something which like started and it's still in its burn-in time. Often we run it uh, for, you know, a few thousand iterations as burn-in, and here it's just getting started and it's kind of wandering off and going to a region it's more comfortable with. That's fine, but like. You can't stop it here. You gotta, you you, you want to then run it and run it and run it and start to get something closer to this or this. So this is what you want. I know this this looks like a hairball, um, but what it lacks in aesthetics, it makes up for in utility. It it um, this is really uh, is really good stuff in terms of exploring this um, uh, this distribution. Whereas these things, they've, they haven't yet, uh, to quote John Paul Jones, they haven't yet begun to fight. Um, they, they haven't really yet um, uh, started to seriously, um, seriously engage in a way that will we'll sample well. 
these are starting to get better someone getting better and yeah okay okay now we're now we're in the big time so so convergence is something we need to assess with pm cmc and mc and when i work with these methods I spend a lot of my time looking at these samples and saying, okay, let's get that acceptance rate up or let's tweak the, uh, the likelihood or let's, uh, let's lower the step size to, to get the acceptance rate higher or what have you. Um, now, formally, when you're performing these methods, um, and I have a chapter on this in a, in a book on uh, analytic methods and dynamic modeling, um, uh, we have formal methods to test this. Um, the second of these is from this book, which I, which I held before you, this book by, on Bayesian data analysis by Gelman et al. Um, and uh, I called it the Gelman test. I, I actually don't know if it's, that's its formal name. Um, I think he is the, the uh, inventor of it, but I'm not positive of that. Um, and, that way, basically what you do is you run MCMC or PMCMC several times. So you, you, you have several, and the, the terminology for this is, uh, where's my algorithm? Several chains or several walkers. Um, that's what they're, they're called, um, Markov chain mar uh, or, or walker. So you, you set one off. And it runs and it samples and it samples and you have another one and it's running and it's sampling. And basically what you wanna do is you want to compare um, uh, how, how disparate are the parameter values between these um, compared to what you're getting within a given one. If, if they're really well mixed, if you're sampling from this distribution of parameters um, really well. And you're, you're drawing lots of these for, for you know, different values that are quite representative. When you look between these walkers, you should see something between them that's very similar to what you see within a walker because you're, in both cases, they're exploring the same distribution and the distributions you're getting out of each of them should be pretty much the same. It's the same distribution. Um, by contrast, if you're only getting started, um, maybe this walker is kind of wandering around this way and this other walker is kind of wandering around that way and you're getting out very different estimates. It's, it's very anecdotal and ad hoc and very uh, non-representative of the entire distribution. Similarly, if you have something like this, well, you know, I mean, it, you run this, twice and you're gonna get rather different looking details. Um, it's not gonna be dwelling on exactly the same things. And it's really not yet begun to fight, as I said. So what you want is uh, with the Gelman test to run a couple of walkers, maybe on different machines, maybe on different cores of a computer. And, and then you compare them and you ask, are they drawing from the same distribution? Are they you know, comparable to each other in terms of their distribution? If so, the cake is done, you're, you're done. I mean, they're, they're sampling from the, the distribution. If they're different, well, you haven't yet really uh, finished the job. You gotta run it for longer. That's a Gelman test. That tests whether you converged, whether you've, you've been sampling from this distribution in a really wholesome way. The other one is something called the Heidelberg-Welch test. And this is something I've used quite a bit. It's supported in R's, library, one of its popular libraries for MCMC sampling called CODA. And it'll perform a Heidelberg Welch, a Welch, I think it's called like half wit test. But basically it's a test um, uh, to assess whether you are, um, you are sampling well um, and, and uh, suitably from these uh, parameter values without needing to do multiple walkers. Um, these days, this day and age, with parallel programming being, or, or you know, uh, concurrency opportunities and, and the ability to run things on multiple computers or at the least multiple cores on a given computer, the Gelman test is easier, uh, is easier to do than when I started this work and um, uh, might be worth 
you know, um, enshrining and in, in, uh, in, in trying uh, for some of, uh, some of the projects. So ladies and gentlemen, these are practical issues with PMCMC and MCMC. As noted, um, discrepancy is kind of in common with other methods in general, whether it's ABC, approximate patient computation, or calibration, or particle filtering, or particle MCMC, or MCMC. In all those cases, when we um, use data from the world to compare against the model and, and train the model and, and estimate parameter values or estimate latent state, we expect the model at the least to reproduce that data. And often we then perform uh, something which I call temporal cross validation, uh, which I mentioned with particle filtering, but the idea is you run it forward um, from, from the data on which you've trained it and you compare it against other data you haven't you haven't yet used in building the model. Um, so you, you test the model with data that you've secretly kept in escrow. You've secretly kept it aside, and now you test the model with it um, uh, from, from what its predictions are. And, and that's, that's a way of kind of keeping it uh, honest. But at the least, uh, we want it to have low discrepancy against what it's been trained with, and we want it to have decent acceptance rate and to achieve convergence, to achieve this kind of nice sampling of the parameter values. Okay, so PMCMC, MCMC, a lot of the, the art of applying them is achieving convergence, tuning these things like um, step size, likelihood function width, discrepancy with PMCMC, the number of particles, number of data points examined, um, tuning those to, to, to get good, um, good acceptance rates. Um, and, uh, but not, not twisting so much like dispersion parameter that you would pair you paired the discrepancy greatly. And there is generally a, a trade-off there. So anyway, that's, that's a little bit about PMCMC and MCMC. Um, now, uh, I'm conscious of the time and I, I wanna offer some, some comments on uh, wrapping up here. So I'm just going to stop that.